think, Jonathan, I'm just thinking about the history of uh, the Chinese Communist Party and like the Palestinian territories and how they had kind of supported the PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, historically. Do you think that plays into their current support of Hamas? Could you talk a little bit about how historically they've treated the PLO? Like on sure. the ideological Marxist mm-hmm. level? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it, it's this is exactly right. Um, from Mao early on, said that there was common cause between the Chinese communist revolutionaries and the PLO. He established very warm ties um, with Arafat um, in terms of training and assistance. And and just as we see now vis-a-vis Hamas with a lot of, um, excuse me, rhetorical support, and I don't want to discount that. I'm not saying that as a slight. That's important in international arenas. Um, And so there had been for decades sort of official CCP policy was to support resistance uh, against Israel. And they framed it as this resistance against the the West and Western hegemony. That started to change um, in the mid-90s, not just because of the Oslo process, although that uh, peace process in between Israel and the Palestinians, but as part of China's um, economic opening. And, you know, that was scaled back a bit. And that's when you started to see an increase in Chinese investment in Israel. Um, They established diplomatic relations in 1992. It had not been as much of a feature of Chinese foreign policy. In fact, their, their policies had seemed to be for the last couple of decades this is a good area in which we should stay out. Like everyone who gets involved, like it doesn't work out well for anyone involved. It sort of goes nowhere. So on occasion they would talk about, oh, the Chinese plan for peace, but it wasn't until really Xi Jinping that you see a kind of reversion back to a more traditional uh, approach. But, you know, the situation on the ground has changed. Now, the other thing that you you mentioned or allude to is that there was this um, to a degree ideological common cause because the PLO and the PFLP and some of the lesser known non-Islamist Palestinian terrorist groups in the sixties and seventies were fellow travelers. You know, they were uh, the PFLP is a Marxist group still exists. They're not a religious group at all. Um, They played a minor role in the October 7th attack. The PLO itself had, though there was a lot of, you know, corruption and siphoning of wealth to the top, but their rhetoric was also based in sort of the far left, um, you know, in a sort of a communist type approach. They didn't follow through on that always. And so there was this sort of ideological kinship in a way um, that is not, that's a bit different now where sort of the dominant resistance forces are Islamist religious forces. And that makes it a little bit trickier, at least in the long run for, for both sides, to be honest. Um, You know, although no one seems to care in the region about the Uyghurs anyway, but it, 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 at least on paper, it should make it trickier in both directions. Yeah. I mean, one of the things you, you mentioned the last time we had you on, it was interesting is that, the Chinese Communist Party has really good relations with most Muslim majority countries. And that is still a little bit baffling to me. How does that play into what's happening with Hamas? Well, it's, like, it, it's genuinely baffling. To me, it's a little bit more baffling in the direction of right in the direction of the, the Middle Eastern countries, their view of China. But I, I think part of the explanation is, you know, China can't really afford to ignore the region, right? Because it is very reliant on oil coming out of the Persian Gulf. Uh, more than half of Chinese oil imports come through the Persian Gulf. And if you think about what you see now with Houthi rebels attacking shipping, uh, in, in particular, shipping bound for Israel with really any connection to Israel at all. Well, in some sense, this is a good way. Chinese support for Hamas is sort of a good way to insulate themselves 
from potential Houthi attacks. I'm not talking about uh, tankers coming out of the Strait of Hormuz, but shipping in general in that region, right? So this is a good way for them to maybe, you know, stay on the sidelines of that. Um, in the other direction, from the major powers in the region, like Saudi Arabia and, and Iran and elsewhere, if you're Iran, it's sort of, well, if you have no friends, you're going to kind of take whatever help you can get. But in the other cases, I, I think it's a function of, of money, right? That the Chinese market is so big that they're willing to ignore what they're doing to their co-religionists and, and are able, not as much as maybe would have been the case you know, 15 or 20 years ago, but are able to control a lot of the press in their own countries. And so we are more aware of these things than an older person in Saudi Arabia who just reads print media, maybe watches the state TV. Like, this is not something that's going to be highlighted because it makes MBS look bad. But at the end of the day, it's disturbing and mind-boggling that, that you would have these relationships while this is going on. Um, in China. Yeah, it's amazing. It's China China works with Israel and Iran, Ukraine and Russia, the Montagues and the Capulets. <laughs> yeah. they could, they, they're great at playing both sides. Well, the, the Israel Even thing. the U.S. Right? I mean, so so China, I think, is Israel's second largest trading partner. That's Israel, correct. Israel sells a bunch of stuff to China as well, including like microchips and technology, which China definitely absolutely doesn't use for its military. Um, but like Israel, like they're seeing Chinese weapons with Hamas. They see Chinese support for Iran, which wants to nuke Israel. Why is Israel trading with China? I mean, this is another one of these weird situations that you see actually all over the Middle East in these sort of strange arrangements. So I think that the explanation for that and, and what you said is exactly right uh, China is Israel's largest second largest trading partner um, is the desire of Israel to hedge its bets vis-a-vis -vis the United States right if if the United States were to, if you had a president Rashida Tlaib uh, which we're not going to have but if you had, um, who was going to cut off all support for Israel, certainly all weapons, and probably do what they could to make sure they had um, little access to any Western-designed systems, well, or maybe even uh, in the free trade agreement, whatever. Well, who are you going to turn to if you're a small country, a powerful one with nuclear weapons, but still a small country? You know, who are you going to turn to for some level of assistance and protection, again, in, in the UN system or elsewhere, you would ideally want someone with a veto power in the Security Council. Well, China may not be ideal. Uh, it may not you, be desirable, but... United Kingdom, France, Germany, Australia, Japan. There's a lot of countries that would support Israel. Well, a lot of those don't US. have veto power. You know? Well, the UK does. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, perfectly reasonable, but I think that the view would be... And by the way, I'm not saying... I'm, this is an explanation. I think this is a misguided policy for many reasons, including that one. But I think the Israeli view would be, well, if the, that the UK and France are likely to go along with the United States, what, one way or the other, um, or at the very least not try to make too, ma too many waves there. And so... You know, what, what are we going to do? China's probably more desirable than Russia in, in that regard. But frankly, it's also been too soft on Russia as well. Now, I will say, we will see if these policies change over the next few months. The other thing we talked about when I was last on your show um, is uh, Chinese control of Haifa port. Um, and then, as you mentioned, their Chinese investment in Israel is very targeted at specific technologies, specific technologies and companies that do not rely on investment from the U.S. Defense Department, because those Israel would not be allowed to sell to China. But as we know, Israel has a lot of indigenous high-tech capability that is very attractive to China and, and to the Gulf states, that we try to pressure Israel not to sell. Sometimes that works. Sometimes that doesn't work. Um, but now Israel is going to be faced with this dilemma 
We're on the one hand thinking very long term, well, what happens? You know, we see that there are people protesting, you know, practically outside my window here in Manhattan, um, you know, sort of in favor of Hamas. That's sort of troubling in a way. Where we see um, that the winds, the political winds might change in the US. But now when we look at China, we see, well, China hasn't condemned Hamas at all. And Chinese weapons are being used against us. And North Korean weapons are being used against us, not to mention um, you know, assistance with tunnels and things like that. And so I think that when the, uh, the war winds down, especially when Netanyahu was forced out of office, which is uh, inevitable, um, I think that there will, it is likely there will be a rethink about this. I think, well, maybe this is not the right approach. 